how do we engage with the world from a place where we're what we're contributing is not triggering or activating but you know we are we are exerting some pressure you know like we are we are taking action but the pressure is not fueling the secondary kind of fire that's just about like it's just another distraction. This is the Beware How Show. Mystic philosophy made practical. There are many paths up the mountain, and we're just pointing at a few of them. I'm Bob Peck, speaking with Scott Stanley, Ryan Paget, and Melina Kiriaki. We are conscious creatives and formerly closeted mystics trying to unpack the inaccessible. According to the mystics, the truth cannot be spoken, but we'll try to talk about it anyway. For Jeremy's episode, we cover a number of Hindu philosophy related terms that you might not be familiar with. So very quickly, um, I'm just going to define a few of these so any newcomers might not get lost in the Sanskrit terms we use. Uh, one is darshan, D-A-R-S-H-A-N. Darshan means uh, basically the holy image of a saint or an avatar or a, a divine being um, that graces you. There, there's a blessing energy aspect to uh, receiving the image of a saint. Uh, seva, S-E-V-A, means service. Essentially, it means helping others. Maharaji means great king. Um, it's a common name, but specifically Maharaji, when spoken about by anyone from the Ramdas community, it means Neem Karoli Baba, who was a Hindu guru in the 20th century. Sangha means community. It basically just means kind of like fellowship in Christianity, or um, it just means group of practitioners. Bhakta, B-H-A-K-T-A, means a devotional spiritual person. Someone who is on the spiritual path, but is influenced by music and poetry and song and dance and their emotions are tied. The heart is the path of the bhakta. Kirtan is devotional music for uh, the religious experience. It particularly refers to typically Hindu music, sitars and tablas and Sanskrit mantras are a huge part of kirtan. Well, yeah, just getting comfortable where you're already sitting, whether you're on the floor or on a chair. Ooh, just really feeling the weight of our bodies, settling in with some deep inhales in through the nose. And out through the mouth. And just like that, a few more inhales up and through the nose. And exhaling out through the mouth. Just settling into our space. Feeling the energy on this Sunday. Just really honoring how we feel right here, right now as we get to connect with Jeremy and enjoy this space and this Sunday together. And together, let's take one final inhale through the nose. And exhale. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Melina. There's always Thank like guys. USBs and audios and things getting plugged in frantically. So it's nice to uh, 
get set yes. here first. Beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great way to start. I love that. Yes, just a moment to arrive is like how we like to call it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, all righty, well, I'm going to just read this short bio and uh, we'll jump right in. Today is Sunday, September 6th, and our guest today is Jeremy Hoffeld. Jeremy is a painter, a native New Yorker, and studied art history at Columbia University. His thesis on Paleolithic cave paintings in France, some of the oldest figurative and abstract art known to man, helped shape his thinking about the relationship between these two approaches to art. Hoffeld did an apprenticeship in painting and drawing at the Art Students League of New York, having previously spent two years copying old masters at Boston's Fog Art Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts. In Boston, he explored the ways in which figurative paintings can also function as abstract pictures, a principal tenet of his instructor, David Andrus. Hoffeld embraces ambiguity, a stance that is not necessarily unsettling, in his work. Indeed, his paintings are both evocative and pleasing. He says he feels no obligation to choose sides on some of the traditional debates over art, those between abstraction and figuration, the new and the borrowed, or even cliched, the bright and the muddy, the, na the natural, primordial, and the synthetic, modern. Very beautiful um, bio and background to your work. Um, you know, we, we just love having you because we're all fans of um, your paintings. I think in particular, your portraits of saints on Instagram are very stunning and, uh, oh, you know, kind of you. keep, absolutely, they keep surfacing in, in Ram Dass Sangha circles online. And, um, you know, you, you also live at the Ram Dass Ashram. So we have a lot to cover today, but um, I think just if you would, First, just tell us uh, a little bit more about your background, kind of personal and professional. Yeah, that, um, I guess that little uh, blurb that you read is sort of accurate. Sounds pretty true. <laughs> Sometimes when you hear things written about yourself, it's like, who is that guy? But um, yeah, I think when you try to construct a narrative of your life, especially if you're kind of nonlinear, and your, your trajectory has been about like pulling different things together that don't necessarily seem um, like a cohesive whole, at least within, within the kind of narratives that we were brought up with in our culture, you know, in terms of vocation and stuff like that. Uh, it, it can feel kind of artificial in a way, trying to construct a timeline is a strange thing to do and it always feels kind of somewhat false to me well but i would I, prefer a very traditional a to z <laughs> plot based <laughs> biography about you yeah um, i'm no, not surprised I, i'm not surprised we're already unpacking philosophical layers <laughs> in this, i'm so glad we are yeah i realize right. that you you're not expecting that i just i just <laughs> think it's an interesting reflection because when you try to look at the the timeline of the way things unfolded sometimes it becomes really unclear what led to what mm -hmm. and what pulled you in mm -hmm. totally you know a, a lot of times around ramdas uh, people will talk about how they found ramdas uh, how they ended up there and there are certain <laughs> themes that come up like kd's music or you know, some people Absolutely. fell in love with Maharaji, who was Ram Dass's guru, or some people later came to understand Maharaji through Ram Dass, or being devoted to Hanuman through being devoted to Ram Dass and Maharaji, this kind of cluster of, of devotional themes. Sure. Um, and for me, I think that the trajectory of my like creative interests and spiritual spiritual interests is sort of uh, everything is sort of conflated and it's it becomes hard to discern what came first I think that my brother and I uh, my brother is a musician also he plays with Krishna Das and and we share many kind of thematic interests in life 
but as kids we were already into a lot of the stuff that we're into now just in a, maybe a more convoluted way and you know and less um yeah with less understanding of what those things were but we were always into making stuff making art making music mm -hmm. and we were into exploring um sort of what would could roughly be called spiritual ideas and interests from like kind of some of my earliest memories of our time together you know like early um pre-adolescence and and into the teen years and, and you know some of that involved exploring through marijuana and psychedelics and stuff like that and some of it was through books and um music and and eastern whatever eastern stuff we could find <laughs> basically <laughs> and carlos castaneda and yeah as a teenager i was really really interested in music and thought that i would be a professional musician and the art sort of slipped into the background and you know and then art came back into the foreground and those those things have kind of been interlaced in my in my timeline playing music making art trying to get close to god uh beautiful yeah well there's a lot of i think intersectionality too between creativity and spirituality and we that's a common theme too on the show and kind of in our discussions between our friends is the, the creative capacity the intuitive connective aspect of creating and how you're really plugging in if you're doing it right and you know it's not over 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 intellectualized or over rationalized although that can be useful as a framework it seems like the best stuff is is more on the inspiring side of things um and so i'm not surprised that uh, <laughs> it's all uh, been a been a, a quilt of of inspo for you um when you were growing up and, and your brother playing with Christian Das, it's so, it's so interesting and special. Um, I, I really like that to, to, to dive in more thoroughly kind of in those early years, I, I, the aspect about your thesis on um, the Paleolithic cave paintings in France is so interesting. Um, would love to just kind of hear you, you know, share your thoughts about those discoveries. Yeah, I mean, that stuff, well, like a lot of artists have been really intrigued by the cave paintings and there's a power in that, in some of that art that's just unbelievable. It's so direct. So <clears throat> like being connected to that and being interested in that from a creative point of view is, um, is kind of understandable. I think any artist who looks at that stuff will, will be drawn to it. And there have been some famous examples of like Dubuffet, Jean Dubuffet and Picasso, who were really captivated by that art and trying to build a language in their own work that sort of incorporated some of those themes. Uh, what, what Dubuffet called art brute. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and for me, like at Columbia, because that atmosphere was so intellectual <laughs> and, crit and critical. And I, I really actually struggled there a lot with that, you know, creatively mm -hmm. and um, in my own personhood, trying to be okay in that environment. So that was a kind of a natural way to try to bring some something earthier and, and more, um, more magical and, and connected to the things that I loved into the work that I was doing there. And I was already trying to bring together this, my interest in this like evolutionary biology and, and stuff with the art. So that was a way to bridge that gap. This like, what, what does it mean to be a human being? You know, how the mm -hmm. fuck did we get here? Mm -hmm. When did we start doing these things? 
some big questions like that. And the answers that they were coming up with were less clear about that stuff. Whereas if you tried to write about like modern art or modernism or something um, more, more recent, there was just so much ink that had been spilled about those things already. And the answers were so established, you know. Hmm. It was more of an open canvas, if you will. Somewhat more open. Yeah. Still yeah. limited. Like, <clears throat> I thought I could write a book about that stuff. And some of my, because you have an academic background, right? And you know that in that world, like, especially when you're an undergraduate, you can't really say what you, what you just feel and think. If you have some insight about something, especially in the sciences, <laughs> everything has to be, yeah, referring to somebody else's work or some research. Absolutely. Validating yeah. a belief that's already been established. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Heavy yeah. footnotes. So it's, yeah, it's not enough to feel like this awe and inspiration for the subject matter and just to try to express that and to explore the beauty of it you know, you're kind of, you're kind of confined. You're kind of in a box. It's funny it's, that, yeah, go ahead. So true. Well, it's so true. I mean, I think visual art, like combined with like academic, like headiness, like there's, I could see a lot of friction there and like limitation, like you said, confining, confinement. So I, I think you selecting, you know, the cave paintings from 20,000 years ago that have these huge questions about human development psychologically and uh, civilization kind of stuff. Uh, that That's super cool. That's that, I think that's right on in your <laughs> kind of uh, anti, almost like anti-establishment type of veering off into that direction. <laughs> yeah. Veering off into the mystery. <laughs> I think that's true. <laughs> and nobody knows what that's, what that art was made for. I mean, yeah. it seems sometimes also people talk about it as if it's all one thing, like why were they making paintings in the caves? But that that art also spans thousands of years and different locations. So of course people were making it for different reasons. Sure. But it's very evident when you go into the caves that I visited in particular, I don't know, I haven't, I didn't go to hundreds of different sites, but it's very evident that there was something ritualistic going on there, whatever it was. There was importance in the making of that art that was not merely like um, uh, functional, you know? It wasn't you know? a blueprint for how to hunt the herd necessarily. It was, there was symbolism and... <laughs> yeah. yeah, although that's one theory. And, you know, mm. there may be some there may be some good reason to think that that was true in some cases, but that definitely wasn't always the reason why they were making that art. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, they were making fires and they were, they were playing music in there and they were doing things that were ceremonial. Wow. And yeah. And you can feel that. Although don't try to write that in an academic paper. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if it coincided with the discovery of fire, because that seems like art and fire were probably, as far as evolutionary biology, those are two major milestones. And maybe they were, maybe they were related to each other, because if you have a fire going, you can see the inside of a cave wall at night. I don't know. I don't know much about it. but Yeah, those kind of questions are like, they're really evocative. And yeah. also when you, when you go in there and you see those things lit by a torch, which you can in some of the caves in France, yeah. then you see that the way the light moves around makes the animals and the figures kind of come to life in a different way. Yeah. Like they're wow. flickering. It's like I a shadow that. box almost. Yeah, so cool. it's super mind blowing. That was incredible. Wow. That is... How dare we just look at them on an empty textbook page, page <laughs> mm -hmm. void of, Rich experience. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a funny medium, the academic medium. <laughs> well, we, were, we were talking uh, when you and I spoke about a month or so ago. We had a great chat about some of these topics, and and um, you know, I think the the 
the juice of today's conversation is is based around you injecting darshan into feeds is how i like to think about it <laughs> um you're just like you're shoving is like that wrong verb probably because i have <laughs> sure. physical fury but maybe it's useful um but um just just floating in uh, you know these piercing eyes of sri ramana uh. or or ananda my ma's bliss or you know, the list goes on. You're very prolific, actually, which is another thing we should talk about. But you, you have so many different portraits of these saints and, and different uh, angles and colors and textures. And um, you're just, I'm just very grateful for your work. It's very beautiful that you are, yeah. you know, uh, infusing our uh, typically mindless scrolling, uh, you know, not, uh, not to be too uh. cliche here, but because there's usefulness with social media, obviously. But um, Thanks so much. Different than brunch photos is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the social media is, is such a trip and it's such a mixed bag. To me, it's, that's like, I think about the struggles of artists in the past. You know, like, uh, there's some really famous examples like Van Gogh, who basically couldn't get anybody to see his work at all. And I don't know if it's true or not, but I think he sold one painting and he had a brother who was an art dealer and, you know, like just physically getting people to come and see your work in your studio is not easy. It was never easy. So when, uh, when I understood a little bit about what Instagram was, which I was really not, it was a late, relative latecomer mm -hmm. to it, but the idea that you could get all of a sudden you could get your work in front of hundreds or thousands of people. Um, I thought that's an amazing thing. We should protect this. And if people want to, it's easy for people to ridicule, like, oh, you're so self-absorbed. You just want to show people what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Of course, in some cases, it totally looks like that, you know, on Instagram. This is, and I, and you know, I, I, I felt party to that too. Like, it is, it is this kind of like theater of look at me. But the potential mm -hmm. of it is amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Maybe that self awareness is crucial, though. You know, the the self awareness of yeah. the layers to it is what yeah. helps you dispel some of those negative aspects. Yeah, or at least yeah, that's we don't topic. know. The urge to share, you know, we don't know what it is. So even when you think, oh, I'm being a ham or whatever, you, you can't know for sure. I think about uh, Ramdas told my brother as an aside one time, this is probably totally, sorry, Baba, for sharing this. But <laughs> oh, no, I'm excited. Said, yes. <laughs> they, were, they were posing for a picture, like someone was taking a picture casually. And he told my brother, Noah, you should lick your teeth before someone takes a picture of you. So when you smile, your, your lip won't be stuck to your teeth, you know? <laughs> it makes your smile look better in a photograph. That's hilarious. So, you know, <laughs> because he under- Years that, of, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he public, understood that life. his face was a vehicle for yeah. people connecting with, you know, with spirit or whatever. And that was part of his seva, part of his offering, part of his work. Yeah, and he really seemed to come at the perfect time and just reflecting on him in preparation for this uh, interview with you. And I think I'll just do a quick disclaimer too. Like the show is called Beware How? Question mark. It's a joke on Be Here Now. So people that are listening to this show, you're probably aware of Ron Bass and Be Here Now. But <laughs> if you're not, um, you know, he was basically, you know, Terrence McKenna described him as a secular holy man. Um, you know, he was a Harvard psychologist professor who also experimented with psychedelics with Tim Leary and then studied in India under Neem Karoli Baba, Maharaji, as well as a whole variety of Buddhist teachers and other Hindu swamis and, um, you know, kind of was an uncle to the counterculture. And, um, just t worked so tirelessly um, for decades and decades to spread spiritual information in an accessible, appropriate,
approachable, humble way, um, so well articulated from a consciousness evolution perspective, but also just so, he was just so damn joyful. He was just so like, he, it, it was really clear, like that it was a real transformation for him. Um, yeah. And, you know, maybe you could talk about that actually, because it seems like you guys all, all the Sangha, the community of, of, folks that live with him you guys all seem to really feel that and, and have an inner tangible aspect yeah I think one aspect that really helped like for me Ramdas was such a satisfying teacher in so many ways but one part that really stands out is like that honesty and um, the way in which he was comfortable or at least willing to sort of share his neurosis and what he perceived as his shortcomings Absolutely. and almost kind of lead with that made it so satisfying in a world where yeah. so many teachers are sort right. of fronting you know yeah. and even that I don't think we I don't need to feel condemning of that because there are so many there are so many traps out there but yeah. Ramdas identified that and he maybe it was partly his background uh, in working as a psychiatrist, psychologist. Yeah. Sorry, I still don't know the difference between those things, but his background <laughs> in, in psychotherapy. Yeah. Um, you know, look, we're human beings. We mm. suck in a lot of ways. We like, we <laughs> mess up and we're neurotic and we, we're uncomfortable in our beings a lot of the time in, in our bodies and and he was willing to talk about that and share from that place in such a brave way wow yeah, yeah that's really I, um, what, <clears throat> that's yeah amazing. that uh that's huge and that i you just you talking about that actually brings up a lot for me because ram das was my the first kind of spiritual teacher that i had found and really lit that flame for me and just ignited my path and one of the things that, um, and I didn't even really think about how this has translated into my life now, but one of my favorite things about him was um, his willingness to just label and admit everything that was wrong with him and talk about it and normalize it, you know, and it has made my path so much easier in that way and learning how to love myself and my faults, mm -hmm. you know, because I hear Ram Das talk about it so easily and beautifully and totally normal. And it makes it feel like everything's okay, you know, and it's, that's beautiful. absolutely one of my favorite parts about his teachings. Yeah, beautifully expressed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, those parts of you would feel ostracized in the process, right? right. If you have some yep. perfect teacher, or anytime there's some ideal there's brutality right there's right. like there's a kind of a violence that's going on when you're upholding this ideal this image and comparing yourself or comparing other people to that ideal exactly and things are being left out and excluded and treated harshly he says uh he says quote i have been meditating doing yoga chanting doing strict devotional practices studied under a hindu guru buddhist meditation teachers all of this for the past 25 years, and I haven't gotten rid of a single neurosis. <laughs> what, what has happened, though, is where they used to be these overwhelming, massive monsters. Now they're like little goblins. <laughs> oh, hi there, anger. How are you doing? Oh, hey, sexual perversion. Been a while since I've seen you. <laughs> oh, I love it so much. Uh, like, okay. how can you not love that, man? Um, you know, and that's true. There, I think there is incremental advances. You know, it, it, that's a useful aspect to his growth as well. And like, I think a lot of his stories too are kind of how he messed up and what he got out of it and what he continues to work on. And, you know, I mean, just such a rich uh, uh, curriculum <laughs> for a teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also the progress, but who would, who would be there to note the progress, you know? Right. It's, it's like, what's the benchmark and who's, who's doing the measuring? Hmm. I mean, sometimes you may notice like some, something that really had a grip on you seems to have kind of fallen away. 
or it's got less of a grip on you. But it could come back. To right. <laughs> okay. I've had that experience. Oh, I'm so peaceful. And yeah. then, you know, and then you get in a certain situation where you're, the right buttons are being pushed. And mm -hmm. there it is again. <laughs> I've, I've dropped all of my traps, so I can't really relate to what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, yes. No, my wife uh, loves that because I'll be like explaining like, they'll say like bob's church or whatever you know it's like 11 p.m <laughs> on the back of my porch and it's after a few drinks sermon you time know. yeah it's sermon time <laughs> exactly and it's uh it's, and then you know, got some parable about the buddha and this you know thing and then and people are just like oh, captivated and then the next morning i'm like banging the you know washer dryer and my wife is like, oh, really, Buddha? Like, that was a great like, story last night. But, um, you know, maybe be mindful now, you know. So significant others help with that awareness, I guess. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but no, but it's, it's a constant thing. realization. Yeah. Holding those. <laughs> yeah. Holding those parts of you tenderly and not. Exactly. Uh, not um, like you said, I like how you put it, being. Uh, don't be like brutal ag against yourself when you see an ideal like that mm -hmm. and, and not just instantly turn to yourself and like well look how different I am from that ideal how terrible am I it's yeah yeah that's better, our better, condition like, the anyway exactly yeah exactly yeah the whole ideal the upholding of an ideal is written into our culture I, I think it didn't start with the culture that we think of as ours like it goes way back mm. Plato and his ideals, the forms. It's a mm. philosophical underpinning of our culture that we create these ideas of like what's perfect. Perfection. And yeah. then we compare things on this plane to that ideal. And it's sort of like, it's a huge obstacle to like the acceptance that the ideal thing is actually this complicated mess. That's Mm. It must be ideal because it's what is, right? Absolutely. It's what we're, it's what we're here for. Um, but I, I was not trying to dodge the question about the dark. <laughs> That's all right. But, yeah, I think what basically what happened was that I just got obsessed with trying to paint those people, those beings, yes, and yeah, and then sort of started putting them out there, and then there were you know, there were people that were into that and for some people, a certain number yes, of people we were are. into that. And so then I kept mm -hmm. doing it and it just, it was just an enjoyable thing. And I realized like, well, it's become really clear to me lately, more, more so than even when I started doing that, that I was kind of like Darshan obsessed. Mm. And there was a time when I was really preoccupied with like teachings and reading books and stuff. And I think that comes and goes, but I don't have as much hunger lately for, you know, checking out this teacher and that teacher. And I think the, the preoccupation sort of shifted to this feeling of like being around the people who had a lot of juice, even though it could be really scary too you know, but like trying to get close to, in a natural kind of way, mm -hmm. whoever was around either physically or through a picture or an image or whatever, who had like some juice, even if it, even if I couldn't make sense of what that was, you know, when I was in Rishikesh, I tried to get a minute with Muji because I felt I don't know what that is, but, but Muji's got something. He's special, yeah. And, yeah. And spending time with Ramdas was, you know, sometimes it was terrifying. Mm. Just, just coming up to the house, I would be going through, you know, incredible machinations of like panic and fear and unworthiness and all that stuff. Mm. But wanting to be close to that light and that was a Ramdas who was not really, it wasn't the talking version of Ramdas that is most, mm. um, the talking part that is most um, known. 
he was really he was quiet a lot of the time. Um, but his, his presence year was just so. Yeah, his presence was just so enormous, you know, and and kind of addictive too. Mm -hmm. mm. He almost kind of from a distance, in in my understanding of his like just maturation, he really almost like kind of grew into Maharaji. You know, he, he, he had a stroke famously in the late nineties or early two thousands and, um, you know, lived in a much uh, different capacity after that. He had a lot of physical pain. He had caretakers and spoke very slowly comparatively, especially his lectures, seventies, eighties, nineties, where he was kind of rapid fire, uh, you know, rapid fire, thought machine and uh, to go from that to to a very muted um, quality was definitely a different era transition but he still to your point seemed to really still carry um, you know the juice as you put it that that uh, that presence yeah I don't I don't have a comparison because I didn't meet him before mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the stroke but for me it just aligned really perfectly with the time that I, that I was able to be around him, um, that it was really just about like being in that space. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was really what I was hungry for. And yeah. And like I said, it was also, it could be really terrifying. And I, uh, a lot of times I felt really <laughs> just <laughs> like frozen with fear. One Do night I like remember, yeah, no, I want to hear this. <laughs> no, you, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, do you feel so here, feeling the, the terrifying and the panic or anxiety as you're, and I'm envisioning you, you know, walking up into it, opening a door. Does that kind of almost melt away? I'd love to hear you describe what the actual experience was once you're, you know, in his presence and with him. Yeah, he could be very disarming, you know, uh, immediately when you saw him. But also, uh, well, he was a master of eye contact. And sometimes he could look at you longer than maybe you ever, unless you went to a wow. a cacao ceremony with eye gazing or whatever. <laughs> but uh, he could look at you for longer than you were accustomed to wow. holding eye contact. So it wasn't always easeful. But yeah, I think what happened when when my experience of being with him was that. Um, I would sort of ease into that space where more of me was coming through than I was accustomed to. And it was like he was kind of holding space for that experience. But there's a the little part of you that still like could be terrified in the build up to it. And for me, it didn't really go away. Mm -hmm. I didn't really get more comfortable with it over the- Was it, a, was it the vulnerability shockwave of it? More, uh, like as far as like under the fear I don't know what that thing is about I've heard other people talk about it and I've heard people talk about it in relation to the guru and I've had that experience in my life with the you know using the guru in the like strict Indian sense of the word where you know like if you were studying music and your teacher or your tablet teacher would be your guru you know in the Indian understanding of that word. There, there are layers of, of this guru, we, you know, where you, you may have your, uh, your guru dev or your sat guru, uh, who's the center of all of your feelings of devotion. But then there are these people who play this role in your life that you're, you're following them. They're leading you in some capacity and I think that was a really long-winded way to mini say that I've had the one kind of almost, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and sometimes it can be a very, um, like, uh, a pragmatic thing that you're learning from this person. Mm -hmm. But I've had that experience of kind of being drawn to and running away from the same time, at the same time from one of these figures in my life. Mm -hmm. And I've heard other people talk about that, this strange thing of being like, so connected and wanting this thing that's being offered and also simultaneously sort of hightailing it the other way. <laughs> and sometimes 
you know, engaging in negative behavior patterns or whatever that are like contrary to that thing that you're ostensibly like seeking out or trying to mm. embody. I, I don't know. It's, people are just super weird. I think that's what it comes <laughs> down to. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think there's hesitation you, you too go, in like self-evolution. I mean, that's, yeah. like that's what it is. You go a little afraid of a, a cleansing fire that, that might be so intense that it's uncomfortable. I could, I could imagine that. I mean, it's, Definitely. I've never really had the chance to be in a presence of, of someone like that, but. Yeah, that uh, sounds true. But and it's, it, the, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, no, that, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're being afraid of the cleansing and also just maybe like being afraid of being exposed. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a fraud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um whatever whatever your your uh, your worst thoughts about imposter. yourself are mm -hmm. i'm an imposter classic <laughs> i don't deserve to be here yeah i remember exactly. one night when i was staying in the yeah. shack at, like you're at saying Ronda, you... i i came home like later than i usually did and i was i was staying in this little shack that was right kind of outside of the main house and within earshot of his bedroom. And I was struggling to get out of my car because it was parked at like a little bit of an angle. And I had some shit in the car that I was trying to get out with me. And I leaned against the horn oh, on the car. No. <laughs> on the horn. But it wasn't just like a little, uh, it was a prolonged like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! Disturbing the most <laughs> sacred corner of the island. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that sort of encapsulated that feeling. Oh that was the God. epitome yeah. of that feeling. It meant wow. I just, yeah, I'm gonna crawl <laughs> under the car right now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> just act like yeah. nothing happened. Oh, Cease to exist. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so funny he probably laughed <laughs> i think he actually was a much more solid sleeper than i realized um, but, but yeah that's that feeling that's beautiful. i am so small mm -hmm. i just want to disappear <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah like like you were saying those neuroses never go away even if even if you are in the middle of you know an ashram or ashram. whatever the whatever the most calming place can be <laughs> but especially if you push on a, har a car horn that'll that'll bring up some, <laughs> some neuroses real quick <laughs> totally we, we really enjoyed your interview with dasima um Maureen and i were talking about it because oh, her thanks. the the devote her devotion can, comes through you you can hear her affection for him so yeah. clearly you can really um it's just so tangible what he the impact that he made on all of you guys and gals it's just so beautiful to see yeah dasima is probably the most devoted seva practitioner that i've met she yeah. <clears throat> her commitment to to ramdas is really unbelievably beautiful to see and experience and <clears throat> Now, I mean, for, I think it was maybe 12 years. I don't really know the exact timeline, but I think at least 12 years she was looking after Ram Dass and kind of looking after every aspect of life around him, mm. which meant scheduling visits and phone calls and retreats, retreats and, and everything yeah. that was happening. Just and yeah. also, yeah, and managing progressively over time, the people who were looking after Ramdas with her, like the caretakers, which started as just one. I mean, I think at first it was just her, but then he needed more help getting around. Um, and by the end, I think there were, there were four guys who were there helping with her. Um, and now that's morphed into keeping um, his legacy alive and spe specifically um, in that in the space where he where he lived you know which is so charged 
And so that's become the Hanuman Maui and the Ramdas Loving Awareness Sanctuary. And Dasima is really, yeah, she's putting everything she's got now into making that happen. And wow. obviously this is a really strange time to be trying to do that because people can't casually come and visit and mm. etc. you know, everything that we all know, but she's still mm. holding that vision and making that happen when kind of the obvious or perhaps what seemed like the obvious path to take would be to like move Ram Dass's stuff out of there and disperse the the relics basically yeah like relics or yeah i think relics is the right word which would feel so i mean it, it would just be enormously challenging and and for her i think when she felt into it it just wasn't the move yeah and i don't so, think we contextualized he his his incarnation finished in december of 2019 he he passed on uh, then and so yeah so this year has been you know your you guys as community adapting to 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 the new era uh, without him obviously his presence still like you say uh, is retained but um, you know and even Dasma said he was so ready to go I mean I think mm. he he was you know he was an old man in the 70s and 80s talking about this mm -hmm. stuff so let alone a few more decades and a stroke and then another decade or so and so uh, I think there was an article like last September, I want to say, in one of like Rolling Stone or something about him that was like, I think the headline was like, Ram Dass is ready to die. You know, like he, yeah. was, he was like, I'm going to go be with Maharaji and um, I'm not afraid. And, you know, it was like, you know, you know I think uh, you know, a long, losing a young life is tra tragic, heartbreaking. It's like theft, you know, but, but when you, he was a 90s player, 88, I think. He's an old man and he had a beautiful, beautiful, full, full incarnation that, um, you know, planted so much. Yeah. So it seems almost merciful at that point. Still, yeah, yeah the grief, people's grief doesn't really like, it's not mitigated by circumstances, you know? Sure. I think that also, that came through in what Dasima said, that he was so ready to go and she's sort of trying to, um uh to embody his perspective in that moment but you can also see yeah. that she still it still hurts, hurts cared about her. of course. Yeah. yeah especially when you're when you're i mean for 12 years being his caretaker and being by his side and i think the what I really connected and what she was saying, and I think I also mentioned this to Bob, is just the, the mere fact of wanting to tell someone something and mm -hmm. them being in your life all the time and just being used to sharing, you know, something that happened. And um, I will, the, my favorite part of that interview is just when she looks up into the sky and she's like, I'm gonna still tell him. I'm just telling him in a different way, you know? And so uh, that was beautiful. Um, so it was just yeah. really, really great, yeah. Yeah, so sweet. Mm -hmm. And they, yeah, they definitely had that, um, such an intimate connection living mm -hmm. together in that way. And Dasima was always, um, at least from my perspective, it, like kind of trying to keep life fun and interesting and let's go on an outing. Where, where do you want to go around us? You know, what would you, so there's a whole mundane part of life that's almost um, sure. I don't know. She probably wouldn't the like that. The wheelchair can't make it off the step and that. <laughs> yeah. Also, and you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we got to keep life fun and keep it stimulating and go and do things. And mm -hmm. and he and and Ramdas really loved that. He loved to go to the beach and he loved to go and see people. And he was very extremely social. Yeah. Extremely social person. Yeah. Well, when you're just radiating sunshine, <laughs> he has I, this. I remember, yeah. seeing, a, I remember yeah, yeah. seeing a video of him dancing in his wheelchair. Yes! Uh, like, <laughs> that was so great. Yeah. <laughs> Such a vibe. <laughs> he, has, he has this great quote that I'd love to just touch on because I, I do want to talk about your, your racial injustice portraits also, but I just want to, I can't help but read my, one of my favorite Ram Das quotes. Um, do it. 
which is kind of obscure. I think it came out of a lecture and I don't see it quoted that much, but it, it really, um, it really helped me a lot. He says, quote, I'm in an, I'm in an environment where if that person wants to come out and play from the pain and suffering, here I am. And if they're in the pain and suffering, here I am. But there's nothing in me that's keeping them stuck in the pain and suffering. And there's nothing in me demanding they come out. Wow. That's beautiful. That's, <laughs> that's about as high up as it gets to me. Yeah. yeah. It's very yeah. safe. That's compassion. It's not inflicting demands, but it's present. Presence. Yeah. What is? Jeremy, um, I have a couple questions. Uh, just curious about um, kind of your time in the ashram. Um, when did you uh, kind of first go there, and 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 when did it become kind of a full time thing for you? And um, I'm also curious just about kind of what your day to day looks like now, and your involvement with the ashram. And um, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't really feel like I have an affiliation in any kind of formal sense. Okay. So it's really just about like relationships and connection. Sure. And I mean, I first went there to, with the, the express purpose of painting Baba's portrait. Mm. And that was just like a, you know, just felt like a great honor to me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't actually, at the time I didn't have any expectation that that would develop into some kind of um, deeper connection with that, like the satsang or the sangha. Mm -hmm. I, I think I was still kind of in collecting mode at that time. And I mean, that's one of the things that, that artists do anyways, that, um, or many artists do, and I think I relate to that thing, is like this series work where you think of something that you want to do. If you paint a tree, then you think, oh, I have to paint, you know, a whole bunch of trees. <laughs> <laughs> make that make sense. I'm going to make 20 paintings of tree portraits. Uh, so I had this list of people that I was trying to make portraits of in my mind. And some of them still are still alive in there, but I didn't expect to have this kind of familial connection with with Baba and with the people there when I went there. And that's kind of how it ends up feeling. Mm -hmm. And with Dasi and I, I definitely have this feeling that um, something kind of motherly about her, but you know, it's not, uh, it's not confined to that kind of definition of, of, yeah. of mother. Right. There's this, but there's this feeling that I want to take care of her. And, and a lot of times I've experienced that from her, her wanting to take care of me and wanting to, wanting me to know, you know, that she loves me and that kind of motherly vibe, I need you, yeah. which is really beautiful. Um, and yeah, so I actually have come and gone during that time and I don't have any formal affiliation with the, with the ashram, as you're calling it, which I think is a nice word for it. It was, mm -hmm. I never really thought of it as an ashram actually when, when Ram Dass was there, because it was just like his home, mm -hmm. which happened to be spacious enough to accommodate the people who were um, looking after him. Seeking him and out then, too, yeah. Yeah. And then like, you know, in Hawaii, it's very common when you build a house, you'll have another little house on the property, which the zoning accom accommodates. I think across the board in Hawaii, that house is called the Ohana. And Ohana means family. Yeah, you family. Know, if, if you've seen Lilo and Stitch, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so at yeah, and the Ohana, that was a place where retreatants could come. And I think they would stay for like a week usually. I'm not really sure, five days or a week or whatever. 
to uh, to visit with Ramdas and to kind of have their own experience too. It wasn't it wasn't very guided, mm -hmm. so they could come and stay in the Ohana and um, and meditate or do whatever kind of sadhana they were into or not uh, eat food, you know, go to the beach and then spend some time, come to a few dinners with Ramdas and maybe have a couple of one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions with him about whatever they wanted to talk about. So it kind of just developed like that. And now, now that he's not there, then, you know, if, if we weren't in this weird period of kind of being shut down globally or whatever is going on, um, then I guess people would be coming and staying mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. retreats. And um, in the future, probably there will be uh, teachers coming and leading retreats in different capacities there and people will be visiting. And I think it will look more like, as you said, an ashram. Mm. Um, yeah, there's a lot of material about the kind of the Jack Cornfield and Raghu Marcus and that, ho that whole group of you know, associated teachers really with him okay. that um, that were doing some of those retreats and workshops to larger audiences with him. And then it looks like, yeah, you guys will be continuing that. Yeah, the future, they so. could definitely, all those people, Staying I think it, would be, it will be great for them to come and lead retreats when that's possible again. Yeah. And, uh, and I assume that they'll, there will be more um, of the large retreats, the oil hip retreats on Maui when they're able to do that. Um, yeah, so my, my relationship has been one of like coming and going and staying there and day to day uh, is day to day life. Sometimes mm. we're just doing things around the property. Mm. Uh, we built a deck in recent Ooh. times. Nice. We, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's just a lot of things to do as, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And it, in that this particular part of Hawaii it can rain a lot. Things grow very rapidly. Birds you know. serenade. I was just about to say the birds in the background are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Immediately yeah. calmed the whole entire thing. <laughs> so would you so are you still kind of in this come and go uh situation or do you feel that you're more permanently in the same um, now? I no, I think I'm gonna stay on Maui okay. for yeah for the foreseeable future. Very cool. uh, also, it's just not a good time to, to be moving around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right. And right. we're well, blessed to have a relatively locked in. Great quarantine place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can still enjoy the, the natural environment. So Absolutely. that's a, that's a real blessing. I don't want to rub that in anyone's face, but <laughs> I do. I feel very fortunate to be here. Yeah. Gratitude. Yeah. gratitude yeah and you're you're also you know it's, it's segueing into more on the series piece i mean you're 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 ingesting that positive energy and uh, broadcasting it outward uh in june july when the kind of movements to combat racial injustice um really stepped up in america um you you started contributing a, a new series to your instagram of um, particularly Black American kind of heroes from Frederick Douglass to James Baldwin to Harriet Tubman, Maya Angelou, uh, the list goes on, Coltrane. Um, and um, yeah, I just, I, I'd love to hear you talk more about that series. Yeah, those, I mean, those interests were not new to me at all. I mean, and it's probably really inappropriate to say, but as a teenager, I, I wanted to be John Coltrane, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. I think I, that's you know, perfectly appropriate to say. <laughs> that's, that's one way of saying like, I, I wanted to really connect with, yeah. with African American culture, you know, that was just innate in my, and that's been an ongoing theme. Well, he and was also particularly what, spiritual. I mean, yeah. Coltrane was John Coltrane was yeah, he was like a bhakta, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's his music was I mean and and that even the, I think that word wouldn't be foreign to him because Alice Coltrane was basically playing Kirtan. 
Right. Quite, and, quite the devotee. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, he really bridged that gap. And I think when he started doing it, like, you know, some of his, his jazz contemporaries were mystified by where he was heading. But there was a really natural way to use that language. The amazing, like, the, the you know, the uniquely American jazz art form is like, it's such an incredible language and so capable of expressing so many nuances. And he started channeling that toward, basically toward absolutely God, you know, mm-hmm. to his desire to be close to God. I mean, he, yeah, to me, John Coltrane is really like a sage and such a hero. Love that. But <clears throat> yeah, and totally, you know, I think you get these moments where things like outer shifts sort of cannot be ignored. And there's, there was a shift happening. There is a shift happening in our culture. And um, it's hard to know what to contribute, especially, you know, as a, as a Caucasian. Um, sometimes there's this feeling of, I mean, there's just so many feelings that you feel in this situation. One of them is helplessness. Mm-hmm. And another obvious one that comes up, I think, for a lot of uh, white people is a sense of guilt mm-hmm. and and shame. And actually, it felt it doesn't feel natural to me to contract, like, and be quiet, mm-hmm. even though. So I think there was kind of a dual pressure at that time. Like one was like, uh, you have to speak up because silence is violence or whatever, like you have to say something. And another yeah. pressure is like, be quiet, like don't, don't hog the stage. <laughs> yeah, listen. And Go yeah, on. and yeah. listening I think is beautiful and such a beautiful practice. And I feel like I can definitely grow in that practice usually. But it didn't feel authentic to me to shut up either because it doesn't resonate didn't resonate with me and doesn't resonate with me Mm -hmm. on like a heart level and in my own practice in my own heart I feel not so connected to these kind of roles I don't believe in them so much like the differences of the what I see as superficial differences scientifically they're insubstantial and on a heart level, they're insubstantial. On a soul level, they're insubstantial. Experientially, they're mm-hmm. huge, you know, because people people's experience is so uh, so much connected to their appearance in the world mm-hmm. and and the you know the circumstances of their birth, etc. Um, so, like, we're caught in a huge paradox, and it's really hard to know how to act or what to say and what not to say and what to share and what not to share. One of my gurus, um, one of my teachers, Dhamma Mitra, who I studied yoga with and I continue to feel connected with, uh, speaks a lot about karma and reincarnation and how we all pass through all of the experiences and that's part of what we're here for. And, you know, I wish I could share that perspective with everyone. And I think Dharma has a way of sharing it with people where um, it's really expansive for people. And it, it actually what you feel when you, when you understand or believe in karma and reincarnation from that perspective is a total sense of optimism. Mm-hmm. And empowerment. And happiness, empowerment. Mm-hmm. But the Western, like, in the west if you say the word karma a lot of people think it means retribution mm-hmm. so like we're being punished for something or karma is a bitch this is <laughs> such a horrible <laughs> slogan you know because as karma opposed to a cosmic curriculum kind of the unfolding. Curriculum. yeah exactly this is the schoolhouse and actually like dharma says there's millions of blue planets you know and there's there are infinite other schoolhouses, but this is the schoolhouse that we currently find ourselves in. 
and we're yeah. working each of us there's a shared curriculum obviously or we wouldn't be able to converse about shared topics mm -hmm. but each of us has our own curriculum and on some level everybody's experience is perfect but that doesn't mean just sit back and relax you know that's why we have the Bhagavad Gita you know Krishna yeah is explaining to Arjuna no this is the yoga of action you have to get on you have to pick a side you can't just sit back mm -hmm. you know and 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 just chill out and watch the show go by so you still have to speak up when you see something wrong if you if you're on the subway and you see somebody being attacked or maligned or whatever and you're in a position to do something you have to try to do something mm -hmm. and at the same time we understand um but you can't tell anybody else that but you can understand in your own life everything i'm going through is perfect it's what i'm here to do or it wouldn't be showing up for me exactly um but you know when somebody cuts me off on the road i'm mm -hmm. still like you know <laughs> <laughs> I'm still pissed off. I'm still a victim. And I'm, I'm not saying that I, that I, throughout my days, embody that perspective. That's a goal for me. It's a goal. But I, yeah. yeah. So, so I think as people who are kind of on the path, and for me, that includes all kinds of people. Like, this is not, th these are not just white people in, in Lululemon pants. You know, these are like, the people that I feel connected to in, in the satsang and the sangha at large are people who are working with these kind of themes. Like, how do we engage with the world from a place where we're, what we're contributing is not triggering or activating, but, you know, we are, we are exerting some pressure, you know, like we are, we are taking action but the pressure is not fueling the secondary kind of fire. That's just about like, it's just another distraction, mm -hmm. you know, because you can't get to that place that we all want to be, which is basically just a place of love, right? You can't get to that place through non-love. Right. That so that's so my, well articulated. No, I I'm, I wanted you to go on as much as you wanted to cover it on that because it's definitely a topic that we we talk a lot about and um, we had a social action episode that really really, really kind of un tried to unpack a lot of these ideas um, as far as like compassion and action and you know kind of speaking of Ram Das, uh, you know that was a huge component of his life. He he you know the Save a Foundation which cured blindness and hundreds of thousands of uh, Nepalese. He uh, worked with refugees. He worked in the prison ashram project. He worked with the dying, you know, he was kind of anything uh, but a detached uh, distant, you know, the, the, there's such a huge, I think, misunderstanding about spirituality to mainstream society that it's this lofty, you know, cushion only or Himalayan you know, detached environment. And it really, it, it doesn't seem to be that, uh, you know, the, the fuller read really is that these practices can help bring our fuller sense of compassion and connectedness to our daily lives and to our actions and to our communities, to our connective yeah. potential. Yeah. I mean, there is the danger and that's why, I think that's why there's so much discussion about like spiritual bypass and um, these are necessary yeah. things for people to at least look at for themselves mm -hmm. and you know nobody's perfect like everybody everybody's working with their own stuff and trying to be trying to be helpful isn't always easy even if yeah. you have the best intentions like there's there's no guarantees about the outcome um I think, so yeah, for, for creative people, playing ostrich is never a good bet anyway. Like if you try to pretend that nothing is going on, <laughs> you just keep right. going about doing that thing that you were doing, keep painting the, you know, flowers that you've always yeah. been painting. <laughs> that, I yeah, don't know. You have redirected your really creative capacity to a really beautiful series that, you know, highlights 
I think a lot of uh, icons in American history that are, you know, under, you know, slept on, frankly. And so I just so enjoyed seeing those portraits uh, this summer. Yeah, Thanks. I um Thanks. I really love that you followed your heart and your gut in terms of your reaction to um because I think that is at the core what everyone should be trying to do is maybe not listen so much to what's right or wrong. Um obviously being aware is super important just like you said being aware of top of the idea of like spiritual bypassing things like that but still wherever you feel to take action um just listening to your heart and your gut and your body and what your body's telling you you know and um i love that you you stuck with that and that's the decision that you made yeah to me i feel like the there's a very broad change that's happening that's um that's sort of like overarching in our culture which is like this infusion of uh, of a more receptive point of view, or at least a need yeah. for it. And it, it's super weird the way that there's all of this antagonism and stuff that comes up at the same time, but I see it as like a reaction to that change that's sort of, it's like a wave that's that's flowing through us, like mm -hmm. through our culture, through the atmosphere that we're living in. Yeah, and birth pangs. There's, Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then there's resistance that comes up to it. So you see like all the worst aspects of humanity are kind of flaring up at the same mm -hmm. time. But I actually do feel like there is something really positive. That's a shift and it's just gonna take a while. I don't know how long. I have yeah, no idea. I, that actually sparked something for me. Um, I a lot of what I've been studying over the last year is, um, yeah, stepping into fear and learning how to listen to resistance. And what I have found oftentimes is that um, the resistance and all of the fear and all the deepest, darkest parts really flares up in its most peak and its most prime right before it's about to kind of break through. Um, because it's the last, it's like the last push, you know, straight through it. So um, I really love the thinking about this in that way it, it makes me feel nice it's uh i really hope that that's what's happening you know mm, yeah let's all hold that <laughs> let's hold that vision well and and again ram da sees the theme today of like his quotes about like how angry people are at peace rallies you know like, it's, like <laughs> we gotta have peace you know and it's like yeah let's really it's... embody it first or you know <laughs> it has to come from a fuller vantage point yeah and maybe when whenever there's like a real um, a debate that just is intractable and just won't go away, maybe there's something in consciousness that's trying to find like a middle ground. Mm. And, you know, between like Martin Luther King's perspective, I'm, I'm not scholarly at all. So if, if I say something that's historically inaccurate or whatever, please forgive me. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, coming from basically like a Gandhian principle of nonviolence and peace and love and basically came from India, Martin Luther King's perspective, as I understand it, and trying to bring that, that perspective into American culture and into racial tension and I an mean, incredible Heavily strife. Influenced. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the debate between that pole and the kind of and the Malcolm X poll, any means necessary, you know, um, why were there these two figures who were so prominent and so easily juxtaposed? Like what, what's the, what's the storyline trying to tell us about that? Like, mm. you know, duality. There's, yeah, there's duality mm. and there's also maybe there's something that's trying to come about that's in between those two poles. I don't know. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of nuance to it in those two figures, and I think it is useful historically to understand them in a kind of binary way. But but um, you know, King was fearless, and 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 X was conciliatory in some ways. I mean, they they they've kind of been caricatured in my again also. I mean, yeah. limited understanding from, from a scholarly point of view also. But I think they 
they they there's some nuance with both of them. I mean, even even King marching in the South when I mean some of the footage comes out where there's gunshots going off from white folks that aren't too interested in. I mean, the, the, his house was had bricks thrown in the windows and churches were bombed and uh, you know I mean there was there was a lot of violence all around him and so you know to be kind of a he really was a bodhisattva you know that's what Thich Nhat Hanh called him he was he was kind of the eye in the storm you know he just had that impenetrable sense of who he was and the role he was playing that um, transcended you know such a complex time in our history but yeah he's what a what a what a saint, modern day saint to me, absolutely. Mm. I, speaking of Thich Nhat Hanh, I was listening to his, a lecture of his. Uh, he comes up on the podcast often, and uh, he said when he was a boy, he was explaining his entry into Buddhism, and he said that he was l a little kid that was into spirituality, and uh, he said he just saw a picture of a calm, joyful Buddha sitting in nature, and he said, I want to be like that. <laughs> because people around him he said people around him were not happy like that and um, I just thought that I would share that with you Jeremy because you paint images of holy men and women and uh, so may you may you paint uh, inspiration for the next Thich Nhat Hanh. <laughs> oh, thank you yeah I think about Thich Nhat Hanh's talking about uh, statues of the Buddha I don't, I don't know where he was talking about that, but it always sticks with me that sometimes uh, statues of the Buddha that, are, you know, the smile is not the smile of the Buddha, you know, because they were, <laughs> these were made by people and sometimes, mm. uh, sometimes they the don't art. carry that essence. It's interesting, yeah. his connection with, with these images. Yeah, I was uh, I was really devoted to his teaching for a while and spent a little time at the at their monastery in New York, mm. in Pine Bush. Uh, it's called Blue Cliff. Where That's beautiful, yeah, monastics from that community live there, and I think he used to pass through there too <clears throat> when he was still traveling. Amazing, yeah, he's a force, and you painted a portrait of him also. I'm just going to be plugging your Instagram throughout the uh, <laughs> episode. Um, really, Thanks. I just have, we have kind of a formulaic final question. Um, it's really just a, a, a book referral, essentially. I mean, just <laughs> give us, give us a, you know, a few or one even favorite book, uh, obscure to mainstream, really just kind of who's someone, writer, or thinker that, that you think more people should be aware of that uh, you know, helped you uh, along the way. Well, there are so many books. I think you and I spoke a little bit about Autobiography of a Yogi. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty not now. Yogananda. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, that book has led so many people yeah. Yeah, yeah. to yoga. And for me, that I think that book really reignited my yearning to, um, to really do the practice and to meet the people that could help me. Mm. And that kind of, that led me to Dharma Mitra, that book. I feel like that book, mm. if I had to recommend one book, that's yeah. the one that comes to mind right now. Amazing. It makes you believe that those things are possible, right? Right. That's exactly yeah. how I feel about so it. So spectacular, but it's so clear. We, we did a whole episode on it because we're all fans of it. And um, that was, that was one of the themes was, like I read one of the pieces and it, it's such a fantastical uh, <laughs> scene, but it's so like, he obviously felt, did it because he didn't like, the, it's so sharply described mm -hmm. that he articulates yeah. the consciousness, like the experiential consciousness of it so clearly, like you just- Incredibly. It, it, yeah. it's, it's undeniable. <laughs> Can I say one more book? Please. Yes. <laughs> this is a really different kind of book, but I have sure. to I have to Perfect. say this. Um, it's had like a profound impact on my life, and it's especially like sort of directed to people who are interested in creativity of different kinds. And that's sure. the artist way yes. by Julia Beautiful. Cameron. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's actually like more of a program than it is a book, and it's sort of you know 
like it's it can be embarrassing to kind of surrender to it because there are exercises in there and a lot of it is geared toward kind of getting you to be playful and and to explore your creative interests and your mm -hmm. like your just general enthusiasm for things in life that you may have put up firewalls mm. for Seems you know as a, yeah <laughs> so I, I recommend that book the artist way by julia cameron i think it keeps cool. it keeps coming yeah. up in my life you are i think the third or fourth person to say it in the last like two months and wow. uh it's been my intention to wow. start it um i just moved into a new house and in my head i'm saying you know as soon as i get settled in here i'm gonna get started on it because it just <laughs> keeps coming up in my life so fantastic wow you needed to hear that <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> wonderful uh she also yeah uh, morning pages is, mm -hmm. is from the artist way right yep. yeah that's, that's a big part of it yeah and mm -hmm. you know many people are, are writing in their journal every day or kind of every day anyway um she sort of tapped into that aspect of the artistic practice where you're you have this dialogue with yourself that you keep up and you you sort of take account of everything that's going on in your days and that's affecting you and you know the, the little thing that somebody said that sort of stung or the words of encouragement or the little idea that you've been kind of trying to suppress about going and trying something different or exploring some new you know new avenue of creativity or otherwise cooking something different mm -hmm. it's we're really wearing cool. down that yeah. limitation thought pattern exactly right and yep. the sensor yeah which yeah. is that you know that grown-up fucker that we all have inside of us that's <laughs> inhibiting us keeping yeah. us from doing the things that are really uh sparking joy for us and, mm. you know expansive things may we all rid ourselves of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah jeremy thanks so much for joining yeah. Thank oh. you all so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's wonderful fun. to meet you. Yeah, it's amazing <laughs> to meet you. Yeah, you know, we really enjoyed it. You. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Our love to the Ramdas Sangha. Appreciate Thank you, Jeremy. Send you our love to the bye. Ram Ram. <laughs> bye. Ram, Thank, Ram. You. Thank you for listening to the Beware House Show. Follow us on Instagram, Spotify, subscribe to our YouTube or Apple Podcasts, or do none of these and just be. Thank you.